The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's Brian for Breaking Down Security. This week is part two of our interview with owner and CEO of Luta Security, Katie Masuris. Last week, we uh, you know, inter- you know, interviewed her about her vulnerability coordination maturity model. Um, there's a lot of great discussion there. If you want to go back and listen to episode 36, uh, this week on episode 37, we're going to... Um, the first question I ask out of the gate uh, this week is... What of the five facets of the uh, VCMM, the Vulnerability Coordination Maturity Model, is um, essential uh, for implementing this in your organization? Uh, If you don't have a way of allowing people to disclose security issues in your applications or on your website or... Uh, you know, if you have a hardware device or an IoT or you use custom software, I mean, this is similar to how we uh, talked about uh, about a month and a half or two months ago with the JSOF um, CEO about uh, Trek, uh, custom TCP IP software. They didn't have a method by which they could share their vulnerabilities uh, with Trek. So JSOF had to, you know, go the long route and it got very complicated. So this part one of last week and part two of this week is a great uh, way to help your organization understand what is needed to to handle situations where somebody might come in and go, hey, you've got a vulnerability in X, Y, and Z, or, you know, your hardware device has this, or it's vulnerable to this because of supply chain issues, and what you can do to cope with those and and create potential workflows or pipelines to handle vulnerability uh, information as it comes in. So uh, we're going to get started uh, right away. The the first question I ask is uh, concerning the various facets of the VCMM and uh, you know, what, what should be one of the first things you, we, uh, we look at when we're, uh, trying to implement, uh, this framework. Hope you have a great week. Cool. Um, so in the slides that you have, uh, there's a, there's a spider chart, which I, I find very, very cool. Uh, it's a, it's a good way of visually showing what you're, what you're doing. Uh, you have organizational engineering, analytics, communications, incentives, uh, if somebody is trying to establish this, uh, this is not like an OODA loop or anything like that, where it's, you know, uh, plan, do, check, act, or whatever. Is there a, you have three on organization and, you know, two on engineering. Uh, which one of these uh, is what you would consider the most important? I mean, uh, in my opinion, it would be the organizational because having just done my, my change management thing, uh, you have to have you know, executive buy-in for at least, uh, to be able to implement this. Um, but if, you know, what would be the first thing that I would, I would want to get up to a level one or a two or, or whatever in terms of, of, uh, the maturity model? Well, one important thing about the vulnerability coordination maturity model is that the basic level in all categories is what I recommend that you start with if you intend to actually do a vuln disclosure program. Most organizations are at sub basic level in one, if not all of those categories. You nailed it though. Organizationally, that is the first step. That is the very first thing you need. You need to hit basic level that your organization has made a commitment to respond if someone tells you about a security vulnerability. That's it. It's just yep, we're going to do something about it. We've decided that security is important and it's one of the company's core values and we're going to act on it. Because otherwise, without that organizational buy-in, as you said, they're not going to provide the resources to build out any of the other systems, you know, that are necessary for a a successful VDP. Um, But yeah, absolutely. um, Organization is the most important. And then hitting basic at every capability area of all five is what we recommend before launching a VDP. Hmm. Okay. I I was thinking, um, you know, it'd be like organizational and then it's really easy to screw this up when you're announcing that you're going to have a vulnerability program. So communication would be important. 
Uh, but then I can also see where, you know, setting scope, uh, I worked at an organization that had a bug bounty program and, you know, they, they, they set a scope of, you know, some part of our external footprint, but not the entire external footprint. So we were getting, you know, disclosures of LOL, totally pwned you. And it's like, but that's the marketing website. Uh, nobody, nobody should care about the marketing website. Please pay us monies or we will, you know, disclose this. And it's like, okay, great. Now we're, you know, basically running an IR operation for the marketing website. You know, why is this not patched or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, and then, you know, you've, I've got some examples down here where Yahoo was, you know, giving out t-shirts for what amounted to $15,000 bounties. So, um, I, the other one I would like to talk about would be the, the incentive, uh, portion. You, you have a, a maturity, uh, level of, you know, basically giving out t-shirts or 10, as, as I've heard you speak before about the 10 point font, uh, on finding something, uh, how do you, how do you get, people to want to communicate vulnerabilities to you if they know, uh, depending on what level you're at, that you're going to just tell them, well, thank you for the bug. Uh, please come again uh, when we can actually afford to pay you. Or, you know, here's a, here's a thousand dollars for what would obviously on the dark web be a $10,000 bug. Um, how, how do you, how do you communicate uh, you specifically as a, as the person creating this to a company that's like, well, we only really have a thousand dollars to be able to give. And you're like, yeah, why don't you, uh, why don't you, uh, you know, not give yourself a bonus this year, CEO, and actually put some real money in this budget. So for me, the maturity model incentive category is really about what is the incentive for somebody to report a vulnerability to you privately and give you a chance to fix it? And how can you increase the chances that that will occur? Because that is the idealized vulnerable disclosure process. Someone finds a bug, they don't tell anyone but you, they privately tell you, and they give you a reasonable amount of time to fix it. And then ideally you jointly go out in public and say, this nice person reported a vulnerability uh, we fixed it. Here's the patch and here's what you need to know. And they maybe do a nice write up of their discovery process or the cool exploit they wrote or whatever it is. That's the idealized VDP. So when we look at the vuln coordination and maturity model, the incentive category is how do you make that magic happen? How do you incentivize anyone to come to you directly? Money is absolutely the not the most important lever at all. It is in fact, um, one of the things that gets, you know, confusing about incentives. Did you know that um, one that Microsoft got huge uh, participation in various programs that used a very simple incentive and it was a non-monetary incentive. It was, um, you could, you could uh, if you did a bunch of challenge questions towards, you know, getting an interview with Microsoft security, there were sort of an increasing a uh, number of questions that you could answer. And if you answered them correctly, you'd get an interview with Microsoft, but you'd also get this one-time download code for an Xbox avatar piece of clothing, which was a black t-shirt that said hacker and you couldn't get it any other way. There was no other way to get it except to qualify for it and stuff. So when we talk about incentives, it's not about the money, it's about outcomes, right? And you ideally want to foster good relationships with the people who are willing to tell you about bugs, um, whether that's money or something cool, like an Xbox black t-shirt that says hacker, or an invitation to speak directly to some of the executives for, um, you know, for, for an entire product line, like at the Blue Hat conference, that's an incentive. Right. So it's not it's not really about money because, I mean, you and I all know, and especially folks who can hack, we could mint money if we wanted to. If the hackers, you know, that that really are, you know, the ones that you want to build long and durable relationships with are the hackers that might be interested in money. But, you know, in 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 that sense, you want to really figure out, you know, what they really want. Most of them just want to see the bugs fixed in a reasonable amount of time not to be given the runaround or disrespected by the receiving organization and to be reassured that if they're acting good in good faith and reporting uh, issues to the, the organization, that the organization isn't gonna turn around and sue them. So that's why the very first basic incentive there is just to have a clear statement 
that you're not going to take any legal action if they report things to you, you know, in good faith. That's that's number one, you know, of of incentives, because you're trying to create this situation where people trust that they can give you this information. Nothing bad is going to happen to them. And maybe something good is going to happen. Right. It could be money. It could be something else. I mean, honestly, when we were uh, at the Pentagon, we were imagining, you know, rides in a in a fighter jet as like a potential prize for things. These are these are incentives. So when you think about incentives, don't think about it as just money. Right. Right. OK, that's that's that makes complete sense. Uh, so you mentioned that, uh, you know, person reaches out to company. Hey, I found this bug. I'm going to give you 60 days to patch it before I disclose it. Uh, is the researcher the one who should be setting those kinds of guidelines or should there yes. be something clearly? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So Vuln I just cut you off because I'm like, yes, I'm so passionate about this. Vuln Disclosure started as Vuln Disclosure policies started from researchers. It was researchers who were just like, you know, we've been beating our heads against these brick wall companies and we're just trying to tell them about these bugs and they're ignoring us or they're threatening us or all this stuff. You know what? We're going to create a little policy and just, you know, send it over when we send the bug report. And it's just to let them know this is how we will behave. So this is what you can expect from us. We come in peace, but we, we aren't willing to take forever or let you take forever. But we recognize that it w- it's a nice courtesy for us to tell you as opposed to dropping the entire thing on the full disclosure mailing list, which is basically how disclosures were happening when a company was stuffing their ears full of cotton and wouldn't listen to researchers. So yes, absolutely. The timeline is dictated by the discoverer of the vulnerability. You can negotiate with that discoverer of the vulnerability, but if you think about it, whatever they're after, chances are it's not the money, it's not the fame, it is probably to get the bug fixed. And if you're not taking it seriously enough as the organization receiving it, absolutely. That researcher, especially if they are an ethical researcher and want to protect people, they will, after a certain period of time, say, you know what? You're not taking your job protecting your own users seriously. I'm going to have to do it for you and let everybody know. I'm sorry. So yes, absolutely. It is, it is in the researcher's hands. Now, that being said, if an organization really does need more time the best advice for them is to be transparent about that. Say, look, we hit a snag in our investigation or we were testing and we hit a regression. We're going to need a little bit more time and give an estimate, right? Because this is a dialogue and it needs to be done with mutual respect. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's what I was That's what I was looking for. It's like, you know, researchers don't know the op-tempo of the organization. Maybe they're already mid-sprint or, you know, um, you know, maybe it would take them more than 60 days to fix it, or maybe there's major architectural changes. I think communication is key. Like you said, it's got to be a two-way street. Uh, and uh, we we had uh, some people from JSOF, uh, Israeli company, who had disclosed uh, the Trek vulnerabilities to the IP, uh, uh, custom IP vulnerabilities. And, um, you know, communication wasn't Trek's forte from what we got from the podcast, including lawyers <laughs> looking up uh, the researchers on LinkedIn uh, oh, no. and, and, and what have you. And uh, we, we did talk about some of the communications issues that was there because they were obviously not used to people telling them their baby was ugly. Um, so uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the, the idea for that. Um, Mr. Betcher, did you have any other questions? Uh, I know that we're getting down to the bottom of the hour here, so... Um, just to comment, I think communications is, is really key here. Um, I, and the incentives, I, I was strictly thinking money and, right. you know, a t-shirt, I, I guess can go a long way if it's, um, sort of a it's gotta be more special than a t-shirt, honestly. Right. So right. there's certain things you can do with t-shirts, such as these are the t-shirts that are, you know, they're only for the research or something like that. We've even done those kinds of incentives internally to an organization, right? It's like, oh, you want this special t-shirt? Well, we're only doing one limited run and it's just for, you know, the team that does X, Y, and Z. So it depends on the t-shirt, right? Um, But, you know, most, most researchers, one, they want to get the bug fixed, but if they do want money, they probably want a job, right? So the amount of bug bounty money, you know, that would be nice. But if it comes with a contract offer, 
you know, to look for more, and that's a steady and guaranteed income, that's a better incentive, right? Before I ever had permission at Microsoft to buy bugs, I had permission to buy tools and to license tools. Um, I had permission to liquor up the entirety of the, you know, of the, uh, the researcher world with my Microsoft Amex, you know, and everything. But in terms of, in terms of, you know, what they really wanted, they wanted their bug to get fixed. You know, they would have been waiting and waiting and they just wanted their bug to get fixed. So the biggest incentive I think is mutual respect. And, and that's what, you know, we're, we're trying to put out there. And um, I think that organizations that don't treat researchers as a potential enemy, legal liability, all of that stuff, they are oceans ahead of organizations that view researchers as a problem they would like to minimize and go away or bury under non-disclosure agreements in order to get a bounty payment. Um, you know, my friend Kevin Finister uh, walked away from over $30,000. It was like over $33,000 bug bounty because DJI, the drone manufacturer, wanted him to sign an NDA, not just about the bug, but about the data he found, the PII he found. And he was not okay with covering, helping them cover up their data breach. Mm -hmm. So he walked away from that. So you have to understand that incentives, you know, incentives are really about what makes a person do the thing that you would like them to do. Money is absolutely not the best tool to get people to do what you would like them to do. I mean, we all know that. So organizations have to think, think things through in a much more comprehensive and, you know, ethical for their customers kind of way, ethical for their users and treat security researchers as partners in helping them secure their users. Cause that's really what, what it is. Nobody, you know, nobody tells you in great detail exactly how they exploited you like Dr. Evil or something, you know, in order to actually harm you or harm your users. Um, even if they are asking for money. So what if they're asking for money? Shouldn't hackers be paid for our skills? I mean, I, I'm a big proponent of us getting paid and staying out of jail. So, um, you know, that's been my, my, my life's work. Right. So um, it, it seems like there, a lot of this was born out of the fact that there's not good communication between security researchers and, and companies, uh, whether it be intentional or not. Uh, some of the, some of the, comments I've, uh, that I thought of was how would we, how would a company, let's say they are doing a vulnerability disclosure program, uh, should they have a form that you can fill out to help get better write-ups? Because uh, having worked at a company that had a an embryonic, you know, vulnerability disclosure program, we would get tons of emails. It's like, ha ha ha, owned you, you know, please pay me monies or whatever. Um, you know, then we would like, okay, yes, great. Send us a write up. Here's a PGP key to encrypt it and whatever. Oh yeah. I don't want to use the PGPs and whatever's. And you know, here, <laughs> I don't want to use your forms. Uh, are, are standardized forms for write ups useful? Uh, should we require encrypted, you know, comms, uh, you know, here's a Google drive link, upload your stuff here. I mean, what, what, what are we looking for, uh, for terms of just reporting that effectively and securely? Well, what's what's interesting is, you know, Microsoft still has the biggest intake funnel in the world. Um, even when I was th still there, uh, they had over somewhere between 150,000 and 200,000 non-spam email messages per year sent to Secure at Microsoft. So those aren't all bug reports, but they were non-spam and required some level of initial triage. So even with that volume, I would say that, you know, a form can help you sort of narrow things down, I guess. But in a lot of cases, you know, it, it's, it's, it enhances, you know, sort of the confusion, especially if the language barrier is part of the problem. Mm. Um, what, what we found was better was, you know, just asking for specific a specific set of details if we got, you know, a report that was somewhat unintelligible or lacked details. And those details are actually in an appendix in the ISO standards. It says, you know, it would be good to ask for these pieces of information in your policy somewhere of how you appreciate receiving vulnerable reports. Because, you know, I mean, if, if someone is new to reporting vulnerabilities, um, they may think that all you need to do is do a little YouTube video and put some techno music on there or like 
dubstep or whatever and send that over with a little LOL. And that's, you know, and where's my bounty, right? And so asking up front in your published policy and saying, please include the following, that helps. Um, but yeah, forms or no forms, it's really a matter of having someone at the front end who does a little bit of intelligent triage and cleanup. So it's not just, is this spam or not spam? Is this a real vulnerability? Maybe. Do I need to clean up what the repro steps are and ask the researcher to clarify those for me? Yes. And that person at that, what we call tier one triage of the process should do that role and then pass on to a proper case manager to do additional work, you know, on that case and, and open up an investigation. But I'm seeing a lot, you know, of, of organizations where they're, they're kind of conflating all of those steps. And then they're just saying, I'm just overwhelmed and everything because they've got a security engineer sitting at that very front level tier one triage, which I don't know if you ever read this article way back in the day, but popular science back in, I think it was 2008, published the top 10 worst jobs in science and Microsoft security grunt, which was what their word for, you know, whoever sits on the, on the other end of secure at Microsoft.com. They said Microsoft security grunt was in the top 10 worst jobs in science, right between elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. This is, these are true things that were published. We, in fact, to talk about incentives, we in the Microsoft security response center took that top 10 highlighted our spot in it and made t-shirts. I still have my Microsoft security grunt t-shirt. Um, so talk about it, you know, internal incentives to just keep going, right? Um, I don't know where your original question was, but I'm really glad I got to say elephant vasectomist on your podcast yeah. because I feel like it was missing That's this entire first. time. You were the first one, you definitely. Legit. I'm sad I wasn't the first one. <laughs> But, you know, you can repeat it later when hearkening back to this. Oh, point. I def definitely will. That's right. And whale feces. I mean, let's give it up for whale feces, you know. And yeah. I don't remember which our job was better than or worse than, but I knew we were in the middle. We were between that. That is the sandwich of worst jobs that we were in. Yeah. Goodness. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, Carry um, a large bag. Exactly. Very large bag. For both uh, of them. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. And 200,000 non-spam email messages a year. I mean, that, that makes sense that you would be right in there, right? Right in the middle right. of that. Yep. Mr. Betcher, Ms. Berlin, do you have any other questions for, for Ms. Katie? Only if she has any more stories on um, like either the best or the worst uh, bug Ooh. bounties. Yeah, that, that was handled, literally, maybe. Yeah, because I mean, you mentioned the jet rides and then you mentioned like the shirt, obviously. So, I mean, let's see. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I have some. Let's see. Bug bounties, best and worst. Oh, well, OK. After I left Microsoft, a friend of mine, security researcher, asked me if he, if I wouldn't mind disclosing the bug on his behalf. To Microsoft because he had had a bad time and he just didn't want to deal with them. And he knew, you know, hey, I still know the folks over there. Um, and, and could I just pass it along? So I wrote, you know, hi, I did not discover this. This is a discovery of a friend of mine who asked me to pass it along to you. Here's the URL, you know, and it was, it was actually like an info leak. So I didn't need to do any steps to repro in there. I was like, here's the URL with the info leak. Thank you. Bye-bye. And they wrote back to me and it was a new case manager. And so the sort of the generic almost auto response, they don't actually do an auto responder, but you know, the, the one they're trained to send back, you know, came back and I was like, okay, that's the generic one. And then I got the next one from, from, you know, uh, somebody trying to do triage. And they said, um, can you, can you give me the steps to reproduce this vulnerability? And I was like, they didn't click that link or read that. I said it was an info disclosure. Okay that's pretty bad, right? And so I just reiterated, I said, click the link. It has some info disclosure that you should know about. I didn't find it, I'm, it was passed on to me, enjoy. And then they came back with the generic response, which I considered to be kind of like the worst thing ever. <laughs> they said, thank you. And we'd appreciate if you would follow coordinated vulnerability disclosure and give us time to fix it before you go public with it. And I wrote back, I was like, I wrote that policy at, at Microsoft and you need to do a little bit better 
about identifying who it is you're talking to when you were lecturing them about their own policy that they wrote. So I thought that was like, wow, uh, amazing how the communication, like basic communication of, did you read that one line that said, click the link in its info disclosure? Oh, I guess you did not. And also you did not bother reading that you were responding to the person who wrote your policy with an admonition to please follow that policy. And I was like, that's my, how far we have fallen. Um, so you do need to maintain some awareness of, uh, I don't know, reading and who is reporting your bugs to you in a good full disclosure or bug bounty program. Uh, needless to say, they eventually sorted it out and removed the info disclosure, which was all we wanted in the first place. Nobody's looking for a bounty here. Um, I gotta say probably the best, ooh, I don't know. Um, one of my favorite ones, I didn't work on this myself, but one of my favorite ones was, you know, Apple, they've offered a million plus dollars for bug bounties, et cetera, right? Do you remember, uh, I think it was over a year ago, that teenager found the um, FaceTime bug where mm -hmm. he was trying to coordinate, I think they were trying to play Fortnite, right? And so you can do a group FaceTime. And what he had done was he had basically called, you know, his other friends and, and then called himself. And before, and when he called himself in the, invited himself to the group FaceTime, he accepted the group FaceTime as himself. And then it auto accepted on the other phones. And he found he had video and audio all already yep. on these other phones, right? So this is a teenager who is not a security researcher who stumbled upon a vulnerability. And um, I find it to be the best story just because it was, it was an, a lesson in relay race baton drops is what it was. So. Apple has a well-established full disclosure program. They have a bug bounty program with the highest prices in the industry. And this kid and his lawyer mom, who was trying to like help him disclose this, could not reach the right technical contact. They were trying to get him to register as a developer to report this bug, because that's what you had to do at the time. It was absolutely, it was like baton kept dropping. And this went on until finally, I think they got to the right team on Friday night, like 11 p.m. at night, they finally got it to the right team. And of course, once the team saw it, they they made, made the decision to shut down the group FaceTime feature for, for a minute, right? right? That was what they did. But to me, it was like, you know, here is an organization that allegedly is one of the leaders in vuln disclosure response and bug bounty. And here is a legitimate, you know, uh, very serious critical vulnerability. And a member of the regular public had such a hard time getting to the right person that, you know, I essentially was like, okay, so maybe it wasn't the best bug bounty story, but I'm looking at it like this is one of the best stories of our industry and this weird state that, that companies can, and organizations can find themselves in where they think they've got everything. They've got a VDP, they've got a bug bounty program. But if you actually look at the details of, can you get people to privately disclose issues to you and give you a chance to fix it before they go to the media and the public? Well, they failed at those, right. those litmus tests of basic functionality of a well-designed BDP and bug bounty program. Anyway, I just think it's uh, maybe it's it's good news for smaller organizations who are less resourced than Apple to think, well, you know, at least uh, all of my customer service contacts have a script to be able to forward me security issues in the security team. That's more than Apple had, you know, at least my social media team knows that when a tweet goes out and mentions our brand and says, I'm trying to find a security contact, that that social media team also has a script and says, come right away over here. We will take care of you and we will concierge you and your bug over to the right folks. And there won't be, you know, whack a bug anymore, hopefully. Nice, nice. Did that right. kid get anything? No, I don't think he did. I think he got nothing because he ended up having to go to the press. Like this was like a week going where he was like, and his mom, you know, I mean, go mom, right? But it was like, she, she you know, she was a lawyer. So she was like, we want to reach the right people and maybe there's a bug bounty and we want to tell them and stuff, but we need to reach to the right people. So I think they were disqualified from any bug bounty because they ended up having to go to the press, um, which is understandable of a rule of bug bounties, like fine, fine. But 
it was the baton dropping of the relay race that just kills me on that one. So no, if the kid didn't get anything from Apple, I mean, I at least would hope that he'd maybe be offered, you know, a, a summer like a new iPhone or something. Yeah, yeah. new iPhone with <laughs> less surveilly, a less surveilly iPhone, you know, and, um, <laughs> and like, I don't know. I mean, I think a summer internship because clearly yeah. the kid was at the very least would be killer in QA. You know what right. I mean? Like what... I think all oh, teams yeah. should, should be paid to do uh, quality assurance. I absolutely think so. All teenagers and, and smaller people to do, but you can at least pay the teenagers legally. Right. Yep. Right. So, so uh, Katie, I know, I know your time was very valuable. I appreciate you coming on. Um, you are hiring at Ludasec for, I, I see your careers page. You're looking for a tier two triage and security we, engineers. You know what? We have to change that page. We are hiring, but we're hiring for developer. Developers, oh, developers. Yeah. Okay. So, right. um, yeah, that's a great reminder that I need to change that page. Um, we're actually working on, this is exciting. We are working with diversity and inclusion consultants to make sure that our job descriptions for our next round um, really don't artificially block um, folks from different communities who might not ordinarily apply. So we're, we're putting awesome. out developer role um, job description. But the reason it's taken us a little bit is that we're, we're trying to be very careful about it. What was great is these job roles that you see there, we actually had an amazing, huge um, and diverse pipeline. Uh, maybe it's because, you know, this company is run by a middle-aged, you know, woman with pink hair, but perhaps, you know, who's half native Pacific Islander, perhaps that was part of it, but we got, we got a great, you know, um, pipeline actually of, of applicants. So we're hoping to do that again, but be even more deliberate about putting language in there that is very, very welcoming and inclusive and will encourage a diverse workforce because right now at my company, I have to maintain diversity by making sure we have enough white guys because we don't, right? You know, and so we, we might need to hire one or two more. It's, it's I possible. know a white guy. I know a white yeah, guy. You know, I know, I, know, I know a couple of them. But so we want to, you know, but we do, we absolutely want to, uh, you know, welcome all folks and all applicants. But um, really, we're looking for a lead developer. Um, and we'll we'll try and get those job descriptions up. I don't know when you're going to have this podcast up, but uh, we'll try and make the correct job descriptions to have them up there um, by the time this, this airs. But um, lead developer is the role I'm really anxious to fill first. And I'm looking for someone who is, well, obviously able to work remote with no problem because that's just all of our lives, but it was going to be that way anyway. Um, and then someone who can help build a small team. Ultimately, you know, I'm also open to hiring a small team of developers who already work well together. Um, the idea here is, you know, I want, you know, maybe four to five developers, including a lead, uh, to work on a product that actually helps operationalize and, you know, sort of automate some of the assessment work that my company currently does manually for gauging maturity. So how awesome. about that? Would that not be like really fun to work on? And also, you know, we have uh, we have every Friday is, um, I'm not gonna swear on this podcast, but it begins with an A and then says free Friday. So it's a word, free Friday. Every, every Friday is a paid day off, meaning there are no meetings, there is no work. Um, and uh, that is true for contractors as well. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, my company is, is basically trying to, to do a lot of different things and creativity when it comes to labor and the workforce and, um, and just being flexible and fitting work around our lives as opposed to the other way around and still getting stuff done and having a good time, so. Fantastic. Awesome. Yes. Um, so if this goes out before the, the careers page is, is updated, do you have a careers at or something like that where somebody could, you know, maybe, maybe there's a job that doesn't fit their skill set and they'd still like to come and maybe interview and work with y'all. Is there a careers at? Yeah, I think that, I think that is, is our exactly is, is exactly our email address for it. Awesome. Um, and, uh, yep. And, and, you know, if folks want to check on the lutasecurity.com slash careers page, um, we'll hopefully get that updated very shortly, but yep, we are, in fact, I think one of my meetings later today is with the DNI consultants, um, you know, who we're working with, who are great and really, you know, helping us make sure that we don't 
accidentally weed out applicants just in our wording of our application, which apparently this is a thing that happens, you know, and it's something where you need to pay attention to these things to not artificially, you know, discourage people who would have been a great fit for your organization. So that's what we're up to. And I'm just happy that I'm a business owner who's able to create jobs and create them in this very deliberate way that I believe in. And that was it for part two of our interview with Katie Masuris. We thank her for her time and her effort, uh, not just in developing the framework, uh, the vulnerability coordination maturity model, but also her uh, tireless efforts in making sure that uh, things like job descriptions, which is, is a systemic uh, problem in our or in our industry, um, is is being covered and and making sure that everybody has an equal chance of being hired and nothing in our descriptions discount or dissuade people from uh, you know wanting to apply for a job. If you are interested in applying and working at Luta Security, uh, you can go to their website, www.lutasecurity.com. That's L-U-T-A security.com forward slash careers, C-A-R-E-E-R-S. Uh, and uh, there are uh, careers online there uh, where you can uh, see what type of positions are available. Uh, those may change depending on when you're listening to this. Um, you can also go uh, email careers at lutasecurity.com. If you uh, don't see a job there that uh, piques your interest, uh, maybe you are, maybe you have a skill set for something else that may be helpful to Luta Security um, whenever you are looking for a position. Uh, and you can also follow her on Twitter uh, at Katie Mo, which is K8EM0. And uh, again, we thank her for her time and uh, and wish her only the, the, the best of uh, continued success in her organization. You can find show notes for this and all of our shows at www.breakingsecurity.com. You can also find an RSS link uh, on the site to add to your favorite podcatcher. You can find all of us on Twitter. Miss Berlin can be found at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. Mr. Betcher can be found at Betcher Pwned, B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. And you can follow me on Twitter at Brian Brake, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. We have a Slack. Come join us on our Slack. A lot of great things going on there. A lot of channels of various InfoSec-related subjects. You can get an invite on Twitter by emailing our official Twitter uh, handle for the show at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C, or you can email us at bds.podcast at gmail.com. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for their monetary assistance by offsetting costs involved in putting out a weekly show. Zoom fees, Libsyn hosting, domain purchase, uh, renewal, uh, equipment upgrades, equipment, uh, time and effort building the community we have. Uh, we appreciate all of your help and support. If you'd like a t-shirt, stickers, coffee mug, or just to show your support for the show, you can check out our TPUB site, www.tpublic.com forward slash user forward slash BDS podcast. We thrive on your feedback, uh, a quick five-star comment on iTunes or Google Play Store or your favorite streaming service, Spotify, Pandora, what have you, uh, go a long way to uh, gaining us additional visibility. It takes no time at all, and we, we appreciate uh, your help in spreading the word. That was it for Breaking Down Security this week. Be safe, be well, be kind to one another, take care of yourself because you're the only you you have, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye.